good evening everyone hope all of you are having a pleasant evening uh, i'd like you i'd like to welcome you all uh, to for today's session on the ada uh, recent ada guidelines it is an honor for me to introduce our very own dr mayur agarwal sir who has finished his mbbs md and currently is a dm endocrinologist he's always been a high achiever he was uh, he has scored rank 1 in uh, mbbs professional exam and uh, has been awarded the gold medal for medicine uh, he's also done notable research work on sheehan syndrome uh, and is also an author uh, for many chapters in various textbook and currently is also the founder and director of hormon india and uh, he is also apart from being a top clinician he is also a excellent academician and uh, he's uh, given over 100 lectures in the past one year and currently with maro he's training uh, a lot of post graduate uh, students for the super specialty neat and ini ss exams and uh, he is very is our honored faculty at uh, maro ss and our cpcdm diabetology course we welcome you dr mayur sir over to you yeah thank you very much dr yogesh for the kind introduction first of all i welcome all the delegates who have joined in and who are sparing their valuable time to listen to us and first at the beginning i would wish you a very happy new year hope this 2023 brings a great achievement for you and the uh, what i am going to discuss today is not the total guidelines because if you see the guidelines are about 300 pages we cannot discuss it in a session what i am focusing today are the updates that means what are the changes from the previous guideline that is what i will be telling you otherwise it's not practically possible to tell you within an hour or so about the whole of the guidelines practically impossible for anyone so what i would be focusing just the updates and also i've included few of the updates of 2022 also like what are the changes from 21 to 22 that also i have included because i found that these are some very relevant point for discussion so without wasting time let's start so this was the standard of care every year it is released actually it's a living document that means it's updated uh, regularly online also so you can go online and see what are the changes okay so this has been released in this december only so that is what we will be discussing today so let's start there are various section so the section 2 is about the classification and the diagnosis so the diagnosis remains the same there are three <coughs> parameters fasting more than 126 that just the basic thing i am discussing then we'll be discussing just the changes so that fasting here defined as 8 hours of fast post 2 uh, hours uh, plasma glucose would be more than 200 or any random with symptoms that is also a diagnostic and hb1c more than 6.5 obviously that should be an ngsp certified lab so that's the same thing which has been since many years nothing more to discuss what are the updates in 2022 this is something i want to discuss so initially there was no such criteria that ogtt should be performed so and so way but now prior to ogtt also they have included in 2022 only they have included this that at least 150 gram per day of carbohydrate intake should be there prior to performing this ogtt in prior 3 days otherwise this can if the patient is restricting glucose then that can falsely elevate your glucose in ogtt that is like you may falsely diagnose the patient as pre diabetes or diabetes so prior intake of the glucose is also important that should not be restricted secondly the another important update in 2022 was that pre diabetes and diabetes screening universally was advised and that age was brought down from 45 to 35 in 2022 update and in 2023 they have retained the, these two things as such that there should be adequate carbohydrate intake and everybody should be screened at 35 and if that is normal then 3 year is what is recommended so what are the criteria for uh, screening whom should you screen for diabetes that's an important uh, thing 
because in general what we do that okay let's get test it's not like that and when if normal when not to get when to get all those things are important so all those patients who are at risk that means if the patient is overweight and obese with one or more of the following risks so one risk most of your patient would be indian i believe so high risk ethnicity is included in most of your patient then if the patient has first degree relative with diabetes history of cardiovascular disease hypertension or on treatment dyslipidemia which includes uh, triglyceride and hdl or on treatment pcos sedentary lifestyle all those or if uh, he has signs of insulin resistance that's uh, acanthosis nigricans so if these patient are there then they then these patient should be screened other than that who are pre diabetic that should be tested yearly now again that was a catch here that yearly but it's not uh, i'll just tell you in next slide that's that's there's a catch here then those who have gdm prior in prior pregnancy they should be tested at least here important is at least 3 year but if you see the guideline in the gdm part it is between 1 to 3 year that is what the recommendation says and all of the patient should be screened at 35 years so it was brought down from 45 to 35 it's retained in the latest guideline as such and then if normal then 3 year interval is what they recommend so these are important thing these are the guideline that whom to screen it's not that everybody should screen and you should not advise that okay get yearly all the profiles like the most of your patient would be doing now um, i would say this is the trend that every patient is getting all the packages and test and it's irrelevant so what was the update in 2022 for the this gdm that first prenatal visit all the patient should be screened and before 15 weeks of gestation test should be considered in all those patient who are at high risk okay so this uh, 15 weeks of gestation uh, that this was updated in 2022 and it is uh, retained in 2023 as well 2022 very very important you see here i have put that as a uh, it's not now point of care poc machine for hba1c could be used for making decision for treatment but could not be used for diagnosis again you hear it properly you can use it for monitoring and changing your treatment but you cannot make a diagnosis that this patient we we know that the cut off is 6.5 right so two tests are required obviously not a single test so 6.5 is the cut off so you cannot make a diagnosis of uh, from an hbnc which was, which is done from the poc machine point of care machine but in 2023 they have changed it so point of care machine can be used for screening and diagnosis very important screening and diagnosis also it can be used so this is but the machine should be fda approved and should be clia standard okay so that is what uh, the latest guideline says so point of care machine can now be used coming to section 3 section 2 only these many updates i felt should be discussed section 3 was prevention or delay of type 2 diabetes and associated comorbidities so what are the changes if you see in 2022 prior to that they said that in all the pre diabetic you need to get the test you have to screen them annually for diabetes okay that is what was recommended in 2022 they have added a line that it should be modified based on individual risk and benefit assessment okay so this was uh, modified in 2022 and it was retained in 20 23 then in 2023 they have also written uh, things about statin it was not mentioned in 2022 guideline so you will be know that even the pre diabetic are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease and these statin therapy can worsen diabetes so there was a controversy but then again the risk and benefit so benefits are more so that way this statin therapy is given in uh, these patient we know that so they have now uh, included this in guideline so statin therapy may increase the risk of type 2 diabetes in those patient who are at high risk of developing diabetes and in these patient glucose or the diabetic screening should be done and diabetes prevention should also be told to them and that should be done and it's not recommended to discontinue the statin that they develop the diabetes okay 
again very important in 2022 they have also included the metformin to be used in pre diabetes and this has been retained in 2023 so in whom you want to use metformin those who are about 25 years 25 to 60 years who have a bmi of 35 maybe in indian scenario we can uh, do it to 30 also because these are again western data right so they have taken this from dpp diabetes prevention program so 25 to 60 year patient with a bmi of more than 35 with a fasting more than 110 with an hb1c of more than six percent and with prior gdm all those women so in these patients you can use metformin in pre-diabetic state okay and <clears throat> obviously you know the cutoffs of all those pre-diabetes and everything i'm not discussing right 5.7 to 6.4, 100, 200, all those things, you know, 125, right? Now, update of 2023. This is uh, recently added. This was taken from the IRIS trial. That's insulin resistance intervention after stroke trial. So what does that, uh, uh, that has an implication? That those patients who have prior stroke with insulin resistance, that means ekanthosis, skin type, all those, and pre-diabetes they should be offered, you may consider pioglitazone, okay, to lower the risk of stroke or MI. So this pioglitazone in pre-diabetes, those who have prior stroke, okay, this can be done and this may have a effect of weight gain edema and that can be uh, decreased by using a lower dose of pioglitazone. That is what is an update, a recent from 2023 ADA. So pioglitazone in pre-diabetes from the iris trial data, they have taken this. Now, those patients, we know that the pre-diabetes uh, can be converted to diabetes and those even diabetic can be converted to pre-diabetic or normal. That is a, a very hot debate. All those talks are there for the reversal remission, all those things. So in those patients who in even in pre-diabetic uh, range, they are at the higher end. They should be more vigorously, more intensive approach should be for them. So this is included in 2023. More intensive preventive approaches should be considered, especially in high risk progression to diabetes. And this includes BMI more than 35, uh, sugars 110. And obviously if it is more than 126, it's diabetes. So 110 to 125 and then 173 to 199 of 2 hour post glass uh, post uh, challenge glucose and hb1c more than 6% and gdm history so all these patients should be more aggressively tackled that is what is an update of 2023 coming to section 4 comprehensive medical evaluation and assessment of comorbidities here a uh, total change was there for the vaccination for the pneumococcal. Initially, what was uh, in the prior guideline is that those who were above 18 years and below 64, they have to be given a uh, pneumococcal vaccine, PPSV23. And again, after 64, 65 years, they, uh, they need to be given one more dose. And the minimum uh, gap between the two doses should be five years. So it was pretty simple at that. But now they have totally revised this. In the update 2023, now just listen what they have told. So they've written all those patients who are more than 65 years, where if the status is not known, they should be receiving a PCV15 or PCV20. Initially in the prior guidelines, it was just uh, they talked about PCV13 and PPSV23. Okay, so here they are uh, suggesting for the PCV15 and PCV20. So this is uh, what the uh, current guideline is that they, every patient who is more than 65 should receive this. And after, if the PCV15 is used, it should be after a year, one year later, they should be given PPSV23. So this is what the recent guideline, recent changes has been there. For a younger group population, yeah, uh, in uh, definition of elderly, uh, ADA considers 65 years as an elderly population. So they have defined elderly as 65, okay? So adults in a younger group, that's uh, 19 to 64 years, 
with underlying factors or medical condition whose status is not known or not received again one dose of pcv 15 or pcv 20 that is recommended and again i have told you this same thing pcv 15 uh, if after that ppsv 23 is to be given at least a year after and ppsv 23 if that is received then PCV 20 may be given after a year later. Okay, so both it is uh, like both uh, the patient would receive. So the guideline clearly says that PCV 15 and PCV 20 are to be given to every uh, of this diabetic patient. COVID-19, again, it's a total update. We cannot discuss here because uh, the guidelines frequently change for the vaccination, COVID vaccination and also ADA is like a, uh, it's not an Indian guideline, right? So, so data, all those things for the COVID-19 vaccination, again, everything changes. So I've skipped that discussion uh, for the present uh, webinar. Now, here they have NASH they have totally updated the literature. Initially, it was just a one or two paragraph, but now they have given in great detail. So I recommend everyone to please go through that part. So that is really important. Two important uh, instruction they have added the scores to be calculated. That is what they have done here. So FIB four score and NFLD fibrosis score. That is is uh, that's the way for non-invasive testing. If that is low, then you have to repeat after three years. If it is intermediate, you have to go for fibro scan. If high risk, then you have to refer. That is what in general you can remember. Now, what are this NFLD fibrosis score and FIP4 score? They have given this also. This is really important. So FIP4 calculator and NFLD fibrosis, NFS score, all those things are available now with all those mobile apps. It's practically impossible to calculate them manually. Okay, so you have to use any of the calculator. The important thing is you should know the component, especially those who are preparing for neat super specialty because it's an important question here. So there are four components for the FIP4. The four stands for that. So age, AST, ALT, and platelet count. That is what the FIP4 score is. And the score cutoff are 1.3 and 3.2. Okay, and NFLD fibrosis score that also includes the BMI, albumin and impaired fasting or glucose, uh, impaired glucose or diabetes. So if it is present, we put that as one. If it is absent, we use zero. That's the value to be put in the calculator. So this is the formula. You don't need to remember. You just need to remember at least the component of FIP4 that is age, AST, uh, ALT and platelet. For NFS score, I believe nobody can remember this. We can just skip that. Now coming to the section 5, that is facilitating positive health behavior and well-being to improve health outcome. The topic uh, itself was changed slightly. Earlier, the positive health was not included in this title. So they've included the, they've slightly modified the title. What are the updates? So now there is vast debate between this intermittent fasting, time restricted fasting versus the calorie restriction fasting. So just understand the basic, these are three terminology, which uh, I believe you would be knowing, but it's still. So see what is time restricted eating is <clears throat> in whole day, you will restrict in some time that I'll be eating only during this time. So usually it is within six or eight hours and rest of the 16 uh, or 18 hours, the patient or uh, the person is not eating. Okay, so that is time restricted eating. What is intermittent fasting? There are various model, alternate day, five is to two, all those, but the most common regime is five is to two. That means for the five days, you would be eating normally, for the two days, you would be fasting. That is 5 is to 2 regime is most commonly used. For the time restricted, most commonly it is 16 is to 8. Sometimes 18 is to 6 is also used. So within 6 or 8 hours, you have to eat. The rest of the time, you cannot have anything, including all those tea and anything. Like zero calorie means zero calorie. What is calorie restriction? That means you can eat any time, but you restrict your overall calorie. So these are the three basic regimes. So time-restricted eating is generally easier 
as compared to the intermittent fasting. But if you see, there was even a publication in NEGM recently, there's no significant difference in the weight loss when you compare this intermittent and the time restricted fasting versus the continuous calorie restriction. So this, this is this they have included in the guideline also recently. Now, uh, in 2023, they have again, uh, all those things, vitamin, mineral, uh, chromium, vitamin D, herbs, species, all these, they do not have, uh, they do not, they do not influence your glycemic control and are not generally recommended. And there are no clear evidence. This was retained in the 2023 guideline. What they have added that beta carotene supplementation may harm. Okay. So there is some evidence that it may harm for certain individual beta carotene supplementation. So this is a recent update in the 2023, which was not there in 2022 ADA guidelines. Now coming to the section six of the ADA guideline, that is glycemic targets. The glycemic targets actually remains the same. There is uh, no difference in the previous or the recent guideline. A1C is less than 7%. Pre should be, uh, pre meal should be 80 to 130. Post meal should be less than 180. Again, there are individual targets. We know everything. Those patients who have comorbidities, we slightly relax. Those who are socially uh, challenged, we relax. Those who are living alone, all those we uh, do relax. All those things you know, right? So everything is same in the recent guideline and the previous guideline. What has been changed? is here that the TIR was included in the previous guideline also, but the high risk, like what you are doing for HB1C, if there is a high risk individual having recurrent hypo or having uh, is frail, having comorbidities, we will relax the target. We don't want uh, his HB1C to go to 6 or 6.5, right? We slightly relax or an elderly patient uh, who is like say 75 years, you don't want to make his HB1C 6, 6.5, right? So all those things now you can just uh, correlate like HB1C, we want to relax. Similarly, we want to relax the TIR also. TIR is time in range. I'll be discussing more about that. So the guideline says that for non-pregnant adult, TIR should be more than 70%. Time below range, that is TBR, should be less than 4%. Okay. So that is what the guideline says. But for those high-risk individuals, for those who are frail patients, then you need TIR more than 50%. That is good enough. TBR is that is more important so that we want less than 1% for them. So this, this has been recently included in the 2023 guideline that was not there in the 2022 guideline. Uh, I also would like to request you just put your question in the chat box. We'll uh, take your all your question in the last because there are more than 1000 participants for this uh, session. We cannot allow you to come live. So we'll take only questions through chat. So this is what is AGP, ambulatory glucose profile, and these are the various ranges. So usually TIR, that's the timing range, the target is set depending on the condition of the patient. So most of the time it is 70 to 180 and more than 70%, it should be the timing range. That is the duration the patient is spending in this uh, sugars, that is the time, okay, and that is the time in range and that should be more than 70% normally, okay. TBR, that is less than 70, again, they have grade 1, grade 2, grade 2 is again less than 54, grade 1 is less than 70. And similarly, you have TAR, that is time above range, more than 180, okay. So again, they have grade 1, that is more than 180, grade 2, more than 250. So there are various uh, important <coughs> parameters to be looked here. And then there is glucose management indicator also. This is nothing but uh, uh, the estimated HB1C, what was previously shown in the report that has now been to, uh, converted to glucose management indicator just to prevent the confusion. Okay. So time in range should be more than 70. TBR should be less than 4. Grade 2 should be less than 1. TAR should be less than 25 and grade two should be less than 5%. Okay, so this is for non-pregnant adult type one, type two diabetic, okay. Now this I have taken from 
ATD guidelines. So if you see here, they have uh, given in more great details, but it's not mentioned uh, in uh, such uh, in ADA, but it is really important because now more and more CGMS are being used. You should be knowing all those things. So TIR is more than 60 and above should be less than 25, below should be less than four. That is for type one, type two, non-pregnant. In pregnant type two, we don't have much data. So time in range should be as high as possible. Okay, we don't have much data. For type one pregnant female, okay, this is type one pregnant. Again, it should be more than 70% TIR, above should be less than 25 and below should be less than four. But very, very important thing, which you may have missed is the target. Like what you do target for the uh, this uh, pregnancy, that is pre-meal should be 60 to 95, one hour should be less than 140, two hour should be less than 120. That is what you target. So that is what is TIR. So it should not be like 70 to 180, right? So TIR is 63 to 140. So it is really important. The target here is different. The time duration is more than 70%, but the target, what you are you want for the pregnant female, that is much lesser, we know that. Now for the older or the high-risk frail type 1, type 2, the time in range should be more than 50%, not more than 70% is not, like obviously the higher you go, it's better without hypoglycemia, but at least it should be 50%. Very important, time below range, should be less than one person because they are more uh, risk. They have more risk of getting hypoglycemia. So that is what we are targeting. And so time in range is slightly relaxed so that we can further reduce the time below range. Okay, because uh, that that can be very uh, deleterious to this older patients. Right now, coming to the section seven, diabetes technology. So what was the update in twenty twenty three? So they have given interfering substances because now more and more CGMS are used. So they are discussing more about all those closed loop DIY pumps that uh, do it yourself uh, pumps and all those things. These are the recent guidelines talk more about these things. So continuous glucose monitoring device, they have some uh, interfering substances which should be uh, looked at. So these are the thing depending on what system you are uh, using there are various medication which may interfere with the reading of your CGM, okay? So paracetamol, alcohol, ascorbic acid. So usually in India, we use the freestyle libre. So you should at least be remembering the ascorbic acid more than 500 milligram can give higher readings than what the actual sugars of that patient are. And again, this is very important. This uh, they mentioned in uh, their literature also so maybe these two questions can arise in your super specialty question so ascorbic acid and hydroxyurea other than the mannitol tet uh, tetracycline alcohol all those things can interfere with your cgm result okay important thing i would also like to stress that there are few substances which may interfere with your glucometer reading as well so depending on what method the uh, your glucometer is using most of the time it's glucose oxidase only so uric acid galactose xylose acetaminophen l-dopa so uric acid is something which you should remember and then ascorbic acid and if the machine is using glucose dehydrogenase uh, system then icodextrin so this all i believe what i remember is uh, your acute check uh, uses this glucose dehydrogenase only Coming to section eight, obesity and weight management for the prevention and treatment of type two DM. So again, the these does uh, this is the same from the previous guideline that about twenty five you have to tell them about the lifestyle behavior modification, all those things. Treatment pharmacotherapy starts after twenty five for the Indians. I am talking about pharmacotherapy and metabolic surgery, bariatric surgery beyond twenty seven point five. Okay. For the Western data, it is 25. You should be uh, telling them about the lifestyle modification. Pharmacotherapy should be about 27 and about 30, the metabolic surgery. In 2023, what they have uh, changed is that they have stressed more uh, that higher weight loss. Uh, they have uh, stressed on this. So overweight 
or obese may benefit from the larger weight loss even small weight loss even in the tune of 3% can improve glycemia and larger weight loss more than 10% will have a more benefit greater benefit and may have remission of type 2 diabetes so this is something they have included in the 2023 which was not there in 2022 coming to the next session uh, section 9 was for pharmacologic approach so here they have uh, totally changed the algorithm again they have stressed on the weight management and it is really important for all the diabetic patient so the guideline are now to this algorithm is totally changed what in the previous thing what they have written in the right at the beginning that lsm that's lifestyle modification plus metformin that is what the first line mention and then depending on the acvd risk factor which they don't mention there just they have written that acvd or established or having high risk factor then you should prefer this that what that is what was the previous uh, guideline was there but in the new algorithm you see here first thing is obviously lifestyle modification but the metformin is removed from that so very important and then what they have written is that if the patient has established acvd then you have to give glp1 receptor agonist with a proven cvd benefit again this is very important proven cvd benefit okay so uh, like uh, the latest your oral they they are uh, not protective they are neutral right so sole trial and all those data is still not out so proven cvd benefit is uh, something cardio benefit is there so this glp1 receptor agonist or an sglt2 inhibitor and here they have also included in the this chart only that what are the high risk that was not there so those patient who are more than 55 years and those who have at least two of the following factor either obesity hypertension smoking dyslipidemia or microalbumin urea so very very important i would like to say that uacr urine albumin creatinine ratio if that is they are positive then this constitute one of the high risk factor and uh, if one more risk factor is there then these patient should be provided with glp1 receptor agonist or an sglt2 inhibitor in the heart failure sglt2 scores over the glp1 and they have included this with the reduced or with the preserved ejection fraction because now the trials are for uh, available for that all those uh, depa hf emperor reduced emperor preserved for the empa and uh, this depa all those are preserved right then if the patient have ckd here they have reduced the uh lower down the limit of the egfr where you can use the sglt2 inhibitor so obviously with this empa uh, kidney trial uh, the lower most egfr which the patient were given the empa glyphosate was 20 and in the this depa ckd they have given up to 25 right so here initially in the prior guideline if you see so they have mentioned 30 the lower limit as 30 where you should prescribe sglt2 inhibitor but here sglt2 inhibitor should be offered to the patient who have egfr up to 20 if it is more than 20 that means he have ckd not only ckd even if the patient have microalbumin urea it is useful right and here you will see that if that is not there then here comes the role of metformin so here in this left part even without metformin you can prescribe these two drugs so that is something really important and now here previously they uh, they used to mention the weight loss thing and the hypoglycemia thing and if uh, there is economic challenge these were three four components which was used or acvd now acvd is taken to the left that's the most important thing other than that all those cost and all those things are not there now they have divided into two parts that is the efficacy glycemic efficacy and the weight loss thing okay so these two efficacy for the weight loss and the glycemic efficacy that is what they are discussing here so here if you see the glycemic efficacy is uh, i'll just enlarge for you so here you see the 
glycemic efficacy is very high for the dilaglutide semaglutide tirzepatide we'll be discussing about the tirzepatide insulin and injectable glp1 high for the glp1 which are not discussed uh, which are not included in the very high metformin hglt2 inhibitor sulfonylurea and thiazolidione and intermediate for the tpp for the efficacy of weight loss very high for the semaglutide and tirzepatide and high for the dilalira intermediate for other glp1 and sglt2 and neutral for the dpp4 and metformin so important thing i would like you to note here that metformin in the guideline is now taken as weight neutral efficacy for the weight loss is high for the semaglutide in fact if you see the semaglutide was uh, updated in 2022 only ada because that is the time when fda approved it as an anti obesity medication uh, the injectable semaglutide which is not available in india okay it's not the oral semaglutide okay so that ada 2022 only included this oral semaglutide in the uh, this because that is the time it was approved so this has very high efficacy for weight loss semaglutide tirzepatide okay so we can discuss about tirzepatide i believe this is uh, important for uh, uh, discussion so this is a dual agonist gip glp1 co agonist it has obviously it's an uh, anti diabetic medication so it works on the glycemia it works on the weight we have seen it has an high efficacy and it has a protective on the cardiovascular okay so there are various trials surpass trial and if you see here various comparators are used for this in the surpass one it was compared with the um, placebo in two with the semaglutide three in the uh, with the uh, degludec that is uh, the insulin and uh, in the surpass four it was compared to glargin and in surpass five it was compared to placebo but the background therapy was uh, glargin and metformin in the surpass one there was no background therapy okay and few more trials for this the summit trial which would be out in november 2023 it is used uh, it is uh, evaluated for heart failure and obesity in uh, younger population in children 10 to 17 years for the surpass peach trial and the surpass cvot trial that would that just now in the previous slide i have shown that would be out in october 24 so this comes by the name of munjaro okay it's a pre filled syringe weekly injections are given coming to next section that section 10 cardiovascular disease and risk management so here also few of the changes are there really important now the definition of hypertension was changed previous guideline 2022 i'm talking about first 2022 what they have told that hypertension you will define as 140 by 90 now in 2023 they have reduced it to 130 by 80 so a systolic more than 130 diastolic more than 80 more than two times obtained on two different occasion that is what is defined as hypertension in the latest guideline 2023 okay and those patient who have 180 by 110 they on a single visit they can be diagnosed they can be uh, diagnosed with hypertension they can be labeled as hypertensive okay so this this single uh, cut off was included in 2022 only that was the update for the 2022 for the 2023 update is they have lowered down the definition of hypertension so treatment is also now changed lifestyle modification obviously if the patient have more than 120 by 80 that's retained in 2022 and 23 but pharmacologic treatment has been reduced because the cut off has been changed right so previously it was 140 by 90 that is when they told that you have to give treatment but in the recent one they have reduced it to 130 by 80 please don't uh, try to remember it 130 by 80 just because 120 by 80 and you say most of the time 130 by 90 but it is again diastolic 80 only right so 130 by 80 is the cut off for starting treatment and what would be your target it is less than 130 by 80 so target has been slightly changed for the high risk individual in the ada 22 
also in the 23 also it is less than 130 by 80 but those with a lower risk what the previous guideline told if the 10 year risk of the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk is less than 15 percent they told that the target should be less than 140 by 90 okay but now the recent guideline has just scrapped off this now for every of your patient the cut the target is 130 by 80 so you just remember 130 by 80 that is where you will start the pharmacotherapy that is what is your target that is what you define as hypertension so just the single number now you have to remember that is the latest ada 2023 update now this i have taken from the uh, ada update only uh, probably there's a there's a misprint here they have written here initial bp more than 140 by 90 but i believe it should be 130 by 80 that is what we were discussing that you have to start treatment here so i believe that's a misprint here so if initial bp is more than that but less than 160 by 100 you have to start one agent if it is more than that you have to start two agents and obviously lifestyle modification is to be given if the patient have coronary artery disease or microalbuminuria ace or arb would be preferred if it is not there then you can give anything but most of our patient in clinical practice, we prescribe all those diabetic who are hypertensive or first choice is ACE or ARB only. And if the BP is not controlled with the one agent, you have to add the other agent, other agent, I mean not ACE plus ARB, any of the two plus CCB or a diuretic. If it's still not controlled, the third agent and also look for secondary hypertension. That is something I would like to say very important. Secondary hypertension should be evaluated if especially all those hypokalemia is totally beyond discussion here i cannot discuss it's a total like a three hour discussion now what are the other updates for the 23 for the primary prevention they have changed it initially what the previous guideline was for the 2022 they mentioned as 50 to 70 years here for the primary prevention here they have widened it they widened to 40 to 75 years. So all those patients who are diabetic in this age with high risk cardio, uh, higher cardiovascular risk, okay, they should be provided with high intensity statin. I'm talking about primary prevention. Okay, it's not secondary prevention. I believe you do understand the difference. So primordial prevention is something where you want to prevent from getting risk factors. Primary prevention is something where you have risk factors, but you don't have disease. So these are patients don't have cardiovascular disease, but they have risk. Secondary prevention is where you have risk, but you don't have complication. Tertiary prevention is something where you have complication of the disease. And now something there is called as quaternary prevention, where you want to uh, prevent uh, the uh, uh, ADR, that adverse drug effects okay so that's the quaternary prevention so we are talking about primary prevention where the patient have risk but don't have the disease okay so here also you have to use the high intensity statin to reduce the ldl by more than 50 percent and this is a recent update that is uh, updated here in the 2023 that they have now given the targets of the ldl in 2022 they did not mention these targets so it should be less than 70 in the primary prevention in the high risk group. And if you don't achieve this with a maximum tolerated statin dose, high intensity is, I'll just tell you, high intensity is atorvastatin 40 to 80 and rosuvastatin 20 to 40. So if the patient cannot tolerate this, then you have to add a acetamide or a PCSK9 inhibitor. Okay. For the primary prevention, more than 75 years who are already on statin, you have to continue. But those who are not on statin, who are, again for the primary prevention, diabetic more than 75 years, it may be reasonable to initiate moderate intensity. Okay, that is what the guideline says. Moderate in intensity statin. Okay, this we have seen. Now coming to secondary prevention, if you talk about 22 or 23 guideline, it says that all those patients now secondary prevention is that they have already established atherosclerotic disease, okay, ACVD established, okay, they need high statin therapy, 
okay that's clear that's like nothing to discuss but what they have updated is for patient who has established ascvd obviously they should be on high statin but now they have mentioned a target that is the recent update so 55 is the target for those who have established ascvd this is in the 23 guideline this we are not mentioned in the 22 guidelines another update in the 23 guideline is for patient who have type 2 diabetes ckd with albumin urea and who are on ace because if they have this then ace they they would be on ace right that's an indication so who are on maximum tolerated dose of ace finrenon is indicated to improve the cardiovascular and ckd outcome so this is a newer drug which is now uh, level of evidence is one here so finrenon is indicated in those patient who have type 2 diabetes with ckd okay or dkd i would say so finrenon is this is this is available in india so there are two trials this uh, is by bears by the name of kerindia so there are two trials the fidelio and the figaro trial and then we have a composite data that is the fidelity analysis which include the data of the uh, fidelio and figaro i will just briefly discuss these two trials because these are the recent update you should be knowing so these are two phase 3 trials the primary and the secondary endpoints are just uh, crossed here so the fidelio that is mainly for the renal thing figaro that is mainly for the cardiac thing so fidelio in fidelio we have the time uh, primary endpoint was the renal failure decrease in egfr more than 40% and death due to uh, renal uh, disease kidney disease in the figaro it was the cardiovascular outcome that is cv death non fatal mi non fatal uh, stroke and hhf hospitalization to heart failure and the secondary outcome where the primary outcome for the other trials okay so what was the population included here so you have to give this about 25 egfr like i have told you for the sglt2 inhibitor you can go up to 20 for here finrenon you can go up to 25 so you see here basically this fidelio this trial was basically for the renal outcome so they have included those patients who have a, a dkd or a lower egfr so if egfr more than 25 but less than 60 with microalbumin urea or protein urea up to 75 egfr less than 75 okay 25 to 75 they have included in the fidelio trial because that's a primary renal outcome trial figaro trial which was mainly for the cardiac outcome they have further widened the egfr range they have included any patient up to egfr of 90 with microbial uh, microalbumin urea okay so that's the different and you can see from this heat map of the this this you must have seen so these are the figaro and fidelio sample uh, for the this finrenon trials Fidelity trial basically it's in they've included the 5700 of the Fidelio and 7400 patients of the Figaro and uh, this they have uh, totally analyzed the total data. So I'm going into the individual uh, trial because this is really important. Fidelio DKD basically the primary outcome was significant in terms of the renal outcome but if you see as an individual component overall it was uh, different uh, significant uh, difference between the placebo versus the finrenon if you uh, have a primary outcome of compound of uh, kidney failure egfr decreased more than 40 percent and death but when you see the individual data kidney failure was non-significant and sustained decrease of more than 40 percent was significantly different the secondary outcome for the fidelio trial was for the cardiac outcome so that was also significantly different if you combine all those four point mass cv death non-fatal mi non-fatal stroke hhf but if you see individual data here the hospitalization to any cause was non-significant death from any cause was non-significant different okay and this the figaro trial again the primary outcome that is for the cardiac that was significantly different but if you see the individual non-fatal mi non-fatal stroke 
and death from cardiovascular cause was non significantly different but hospitalization to heart failure was significantly different but if you combine all those four primary outcome it was significantly different for the secondary outcome of this trial that was for the renal that again if you see if they uh, more than 50% decline that was significantly different but more than 40% was non significant uh, different hospitalization was non significantly different and death from any cause was also non significantly different coming to the section 11 that is the ckd and the risk management so here they have decreased i have told you already egfr up to 20 is what you can prescribe this uh, sglt2 inhibitor so for any patient who are type 2 diabetic you have to use this sglt2 inhibitor to reduce the ckd and cardiovascular outcome and here those patient who have egfr more than uh, 20 with positive microalbumin urea you have to give this initially in the prior trial 20 uh, ada 2022 guideline it was mentioned as 25 and urine albumin of more than 300 but they have reduced these two so that's an recent update from the ada 20 Three, coming to next section, retinopathy, neuropathy. Here, few changes are being there. So, in twenty twenty two, they have uh, advised for anti VEGF injections. That's anti vascular endothelial growth factor injections as an alternative to pan ret uh, pan retinal photocoagulation in the uh, PDR proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And they have also indicated as a first line in those patients who have macular edema. which involves the foveal center okay so that is what was the update in 2022 it has been retained in 23 in 23 they have totally changed how we practice for the uh, this neuropathy thing so what recent guidelines says that gabapentinoids snri tca and sodium channel blockers are recommended as initial pharmacologic treatment for neuropathic pain in diabetes so this is the recent change if you see previously tca was not included it was against uh, uh, tca so what are snri duloxetin was anyhow was included in the previous guideline but this venlafaxine was not included in the previous guideline so this snri whether you talk about duloxetin venlafaxine desvenlafaxine these are now they can be given for painful diabetic neuropathy so they are uh, i'll not go into detail all those studies if you want you can go through guideline but this is what the recent ada 23 says previously in 22 this was clearly written tca venlafaxine carbamazepine and topical uh, capsaicin this was not approved okay this was sorry this was not approved for the treatment of painful diabetic neuropathy but now these are approved except for carbamazepin so tca is now approved uh, venlafaxine is approved uh, this is also now approved so tca has been uh, mainly it is the amitriptyline which is used for the uh, painful neuropathy coming to this uh, capsaicin this is mean fda approved 8% patch topical especially in those patient whom you cannot give oral pharmacotherapy or those patient who prefer topical pharmacotherapy painful diabetic neuropathy now you can prescribe this also this is a recent update in 2023 and it was against like totally it was against in 22 so it's uh, very important to know this coming to the sodium channel blocker if you see here ox carbamazepine valproate lamotrigin and uh, locosamide this have been this can be used because now there are trials for this but carbamazepine is not included here what the recent update says that carbamazepine and ala alpha lipoic acid not approved but may be considered so they are not actually approved as such by the guideline so this you should remember what other uh, things they have updated in the foot examination they now have included about examination screening for the pat that's peripheral arterial disease so this should include the uh, evaluation include the lower extremity pulses crt capillary refilling time 
river on dependency pallor on elevation and the venous filling time so this is something they have included and those patient in whom abi that's ankle brachial index is indicated all those things are all, everything is same from the previous guideline but this only this initial screening has been updated in the 2023 guidelines coming to management of diabetes in pregnancy that's uh, that's the section 15 of the ada guideline here only one change i would say is important for you to know that's breastfeeding can reduce the risk and is recommended to reduce the risk of the type 2 diabetes okay so this is something important that has been included in 22 also guideline they have included that breastfeeding may have longer term metabolic benefit to both mother and offspring but it can increase the hypoglycemia and accordingly you should adjust the dose of your insulin but two things they have included here that the breastfeeding reduces the risk of developing of type 2 diabetes in the mothers with previous gdm and this may uh, have uh, some improvement in the metabolic risk factors of the offspring so these two points were included in the recent guideline which were not there in 2022 coming to our last section that diabetes care in the hospital so the target remains the same if you have more than 180 in those critically ill patients you can in you cannot you should initiate uh, insulin and your targets are 140 to 180 that is the same in whether you talk 22 23 guidelines but stringent criteria if without hypoglycemia you can maintain the initial in 22 uh, guidelines it was just 110 to 140 but now they have slightly increased it and they have increased to 1 100 to 180 is what they are recommending so they are going further lower down okay with uh, if you can go further lower down without hypoglycemia so this is from the recent ada 2023 so with this uh, almost everything i have tried to cover i know it's like really tough to uh, remember all those things and even tougher to discuss uh, if i go in detail so the take home message now point of care machine if reliable and i believe in india uh, i cannot quote it obviously but what i remember is uh, only the afinion abort is someone uh, who claims that they have this accuracy for diagnosis okay so that is point of care hba1c machine are now approved pioglitazone is to be given in those patient considered in those patient who have pre diabetes with stroke and insulin resistance feature vaccination totally is changed nfld now they have included the section is totally uh, updated and fif4 score is something which they have included time restricted or calorie restricted intermittent fasting these all things have been updated and all those things are equal at par with each other tir elderly frail patient tir should be more than uh 50% it's not more than 70 what is the recommendation more important is tbr should be less than 1% in frail patient cgms interfering substances i have already discussed important thing to remember is ascorbic acid hypertension definition target everything is changed you have to remember 130 by 80 that is the number very important statin in the primary prevention group high statin high dose intensity all those the range has been changed ldl targets in primary prevention less than 70 in secondary it's 55 finrenone we have discussed in great detail diabetic neuropathy now tca venlafaxine all those topical things have been approved treatment algorithm is totally changed the metformin is brought down to uh, lower importance sglt2 inhibitor that is now you can prescribe up to 20 egfr that is what the latest guidelines are there so thank you for your patient hearing we'll now take uh, the questions you can put a uh, question in chat box i'll be very happy to discuss with you all okay so uh, dr sejal is asking how would you measure 150 gram so that is uh recommendation is more than 150 g if the patient is taking less than that then your ogtt would be falsely high so that is the lower limit and obviously it's an uh, rough calculation like uh, a chapati would be obviously you like in general you calculate it's of 20 g but again somebody would be making thicker chapatis and all those there are errors in that i do agree with that 
डॉक्टर ऑरुक वॉन्ट्स एंड डिजिटल कॉपी सो दिस प्रेजेंटेशन वुड बी अपलोडेड इन आई बिलीव यूट्यूब यू कैन सी वेन एवर यू वॉन्ट डॉक्टर Manolina is asking what is time in range. Okay, so see, I have again. I'll tell you very basic thing. It is the duration the patient is spending in the whole day within that time, whatever you have decided that range. Ah, uh, like for most of the patient, we would be deciding seventy to one eighty. So what overall? Let's say in twenty four hours, if the patient have. For twelve hours, his sugars were between seventy to one eighty, some ninety, uh, hundred and ten, something like that, whatever. So, if only for twelve hours it was within this range, so his time in range is fifty percent. So this is a very simple thing, time in range. Because see, when you are seeing HbA1c, you are seeing highs and lows, which will make your HbA1c normal. Right? If the patient is having too high, too many hypos, too many hypers, his HbA1c will become normal. And again, there are various fallacies. All those hemoglobinopathies, all those things. What method you are using, and too many changes can be there. So these are very important concepts. That not only your HbA1c is important, your time in range is important. This time in range, seventy percent is actually calculated. This this data is gained from your HbA1c only. HbA1c of seven corresponds to your TIR of seventy percent. That is why we have made the TIR should be more than seventy percent. okay uh gliptin for the preventive therapy of pre diabetes dr sunil is asking it's not approved but we have a verified trial of wilda gliptin we showed that this may have better uh, beta cell preservation those patient who were given wilda plus metformin against metformin alone this was a trial for around 5 uh, years so they required a third drug later on who was initiated two drugs right from the beginning okay so that is what we have metabolic memory and legacy effect dr shubham is asking this is uh, i've dis i'll just discuss again so see uh, let's say you have two group of patient uh, one group you have good glycemic control in the earlier phase let's let's make it more simple i'm taking arbitrary data you have paid 20 years of diabetic two type of group one patient whose uh, sugars were better controlled in the initial 10 years but later on next 10 years he did not have that good control versus a patient who have a 10 year very bad initial and later on 10 years next 10 years he had better control so those patient whose initial sugars are better control they have lesser complications so this is what is metabolic memory or the legacy effect dr asma is asking any change in the cut off of criteria of gdf no there are no cut uh, change in the cut off that is why i have not discussed dr vedant is asking to show me uh, the slide again so that you can just go back and you can discuss uh dr nagarjun is asking about the guideline in non diabetic hypertension that's totally different thing we cannot discuss it here i have just told you the ada updates dr adarsh wants the ppt again i have told you you can just see uh Stress in uh, Doctor Hari Haran is asking about indre, uh, stress induced hyperglycemia and steroid induced hyperglycemia. That's a totally different thing, and depending on what steroid you are using, how much dose you are using, what regimes, and all those things, I believe we cannot discuss it here. Doctor Umair is asking treatment of hypertension starts at one forty by ninety. That is the change they have now given it one thirty by eighty. That's the change. Doctor Sahel also wants an uh, uh, discussion over CGMS parameters. So I believe we can have an another session of one or two hours. Uh, totally dedicated to CGMS because I believe there are too many doubts and most of you have not used CGMS. 
aspirin and all those things dr mohammed they have not changed anything i have not discussed that is why dr tahir is asking what's the maximum dose of insulin which can be used there is no such upper limit you can use any dose of insulin you want dr nitesh is asking in non affording patient with sglt2 inhibitor see now sglt2 especially this uh, dapa is now off patent it is coming at the same cost as any of your drug whatever you want to prescribe so i believe that's not an issue but yes obviously glp are just we have three glp in uh, india we have injectable liraglutide we have injectable injectable divaglutide we have oral semaglutide whatever you use it would be more than 5000 per month so that's an issue i do agree dr akash is asking uh, the lower limit is 62 for high uh, pregnant female so wouldn't be hypoglycemia no for the pregnancy it's totally different targets and like in generally what you say that less than 70 the patient should consume sugar and all those things that's not for the diabet uh, diabetic pregnant female it is 60 that is taken as the cut off and also there are actually no strict cut off for hypoglycemia uh, actually hypoglycemia we can have a session different session it would be in a uh, one hour discussion so there actually there is no cut off of hypoglycemia if you see the literature if you will read in depth the uh, it's more often symptom based and all those things so uh, and whipple stride all those things it's not an strict cut off or a number value which you can assign okay this is hypoglycemia uh i don't know the name of the doctor but he is asking that why are the criteria for the gdm kept low so that is from the hope trial all those data are there and that i believe you must be knowing that is why these cut offs are different for the gdm dr kovery is asking about glycolazide and glipizide in ckd okay we often use them glycolazide can be used without dose modification linagliptin can be used without dose modification so this can be used in ckd patient but most of the time because they have all those decrease appetite and all those things usually most of your patient would be on the insulin and uh, ckd all those things and um, all those uh, ohs and everything they they have not been changed in any of the recent thing we don't have any updates on that so it's a previous all those things apply here also in our cpcdm uh, this course we have a dedicated session for all those things Uh, dr rahima has an interesting question regarding balanopostitis if the patient develop sglt2 inhibitor obviously we do rechallenge with the sglt2 inhibitor once the balanopostitis is uh, cured dr nitesh is asking any update in the type 1 uh, diabetes uh, there are few updates on especially on those pumps and closed loop thing but i have not brought to the discussion because already this discussion is uh, i believe pretty hard to digest dr shrivardhan wants the algorithm uh, so algorithm you can just go on the site it will uh, it is there Uh, dr nagarjun is asking any update on the dpp4 inhibitor sulfonylurea nothing has been changed except uh, there i believe they are put further lower down because your patient will fall into some category he would have hypertension he would have uh, obesity he would have microalbuminuria uh, dr moda sir is asking can we use an sglt2 inhibitor in type 1 diabetes uh, see dapagliposin was Uh, actually approved for type one diabetes in Japan, and but the ADA don't suggest that. 
and also you would land your patient in DK. So ideally, you should not be using any SGLT2 inhibitor in type 1 diabetes. Also, even in type 2 diabetes, uh, I've seen few patients with euglycemic DK, especially uh, we when we motivate them too much and when they are on SGLT2 inhibitor and they eat very, very less, that time the patient can develop euglycemic DK. I have admitted few patients such. Dr. Venganashan is asking maximum dose of rhizotec. Again, see, all those insulin, there is no upper dose which you can prescribe. Okay, so Dr. Kukire is asking a very important question here. The concept of reversal. So, see, there are two things, reversal and remission of diabetes. Reversal is basically when the sugars are controlled that mean, without uh, medication. That means your HbA1c is less than 6.5 without medicine is your reversal of diabetes. Remission is when this is lasting for more than three months, then you say that this is remission. Okay, reversal is at that point, remission is over three months. There are few more questions I'm skipping because it's already quarter to 10. Only those which I believe are pertaining to the updates because all those things uh, we have discussed somewhere or we have in our courses. Okay, this uh, Dr. Samik Ghosh has asked an interesting question. Can an HGLT2 inhibitor can be given to a patient who has past history of UTI, uncomplicated or complicated? Yes, it can be given if there is an indication with proper hygiene and all those things uh, told to the patient. Ideally, you should be giving if there is indication of this drug. So I believe I have answered most of the question. Is Still, there are few questions uh, remaining unanswered, but it's more than an hour. Uh, you can post your questions and we may try to answer that. We'll be, if we are able to answer, we'll able, we may send you a mail because there are too many questions here. Thank you everyone who has joined in. I believe the session was useful for you. Further doubts uh, we'll take you can just post us, you can mail us or you can put on the Facebook as well of the Marrow page. So thank you. Good night and wishing you happy new year again.